broken glass and broken vows I'll be 18 four years from now With different friends in a different town I'll finally be free I'm happy to be here Everything is not good, but I am in the studio All right, welcome to Rock Docs A podcast about music documentaries Brought to you by Treble Media We're at Rock Docs Pod on Twitter and Instagram I'm a host of this podcast, David Lizabram, here with my other host, Andrew Keats. And today's movie is uh, Jason Isbell, Running With Our Eyes Closed, directed by friend of the podcast, Sam Jones. I'm just going to say right at the top, uh, if you scroll back in the feed here, uh, a couple weeks ago as this comes out, we spoke to the director, Sam Jones, and he could not have been nicer. He also directed the Wilco documentary, I'm Trying to Break Your Heart, and... Um, Boy, it was just such a pleasure to get to speak to him. So um, after you're done listening to this or whatever, uh, if you haven't checked that out, I encourage you to do so. Um, okay. Uh, and that movie is uh, a music box joint. On yeah, HBO I was going to say, if you, have you made an official declaration that we're not, we're not entertaining the music box as, as part of the title? It's not, it's not music box, Jason Isbell running down a drink. Is that the is that the official? No, not first of all. It's definitely not running down a dream. Not running down a dream. I keep trying to say running on empty. <laughs> run Jason Isbell run, running run on empty, empty down a dream, on dream presented by Music Box on HBO, which is now Max. Yeah. That's the yeah. official title. Um, I think, I think Music a 20, Box is in the it's title. a twenty twenty three movie. And today we're joined by our very special guest, Stephen Woods. Uh, he is uh, an, a Jason Isbell fan, uh, a great guy, a fellow uh, you know uh, San Diego sports guy as well. So we like that. We get a little bit of that flavor in here for those of you who sports are and music. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying, like, uh, you know, for those of you, that little Venn diagram of the four people who listen to this who are also, uh, you know, following the Padres and living and dying by it, uh, that's uh, that's kind of our vibe here. But um, anyway, Stephen, say hi. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Andy, you want to uh, you want to tee this up with our usual kind of how we walk into these things? Well, I guess. We have uh, we have we have here a movie about Jason Isbell, and uh, I mean it seems weird to go over the the plot of it in broad terms since we talked about it with with Sam. But I mean, I th- I think the, the 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 premise here is is Sam walks in with a camera and he knows that they're making a record and that's about all he knows and he's gonna figure out the rest as they go. And boy, did a lot happen. Uh, I think I think it would have been a fine movie if not much had happened because Jason Isbell is such an interesting guy and the music's really good. And, you know, maybe we spend more time like strictly on the material in that scenario. Um, but instead, we, we still spend quite a bit of time with the material and get to hear a lot of the music. We got to hear a lot from Jason, but also he has quite a bit of problems with his wife. There's a... a, a a, something of a split temporarily during the course of making the, the record. Uh, and then the pandemic hits and uh, we, they send some cameras home with the family. We see them living in quarantine in their, in their rural home. Um, and, uh, and in, over the course of it, we also go back through Jason's life as, through his childhood, through his uh, time with the drive-by truckers, his uh, work recover, uh, recovering from alcoholism, and uh, and learn a heck of a lot about the guy um, over the over the over the course of all that. I guess my first question for you, Steve, uh, and we can use this as a path into your your place as like a big big Isbel guy, like the biggest Jason Isbel fan I I, I, know, <laughs> I, I know of. Um, what it like how much did you learn about jason isbell here i'm I'm sure you're like steeped in in his biography so so watching you know, all this what did you learn about him you know i knew i knew a lot uh i knew a lot of it and and i i think you never know really the depths uh that somebody's in and and i'll tell you the the craziest scene for me was when his manager pulled that old dvd out and showed his last hurrah and uh when it showed him you know hey I need help. I need help. And, but I got one more in me. Yeah. And he, he's talking about how he's on stage and he's, you see him drinking from the Jack bottle. Then he goes, I also took some MDMA (laughs) and I'm laughing, I'm laughing going, wow. Like I I knew, I knew you got drunk, but I didn't know, you know, you were popping Molly up there too. (laughs) And, um, 
on stage and then you see him like like just out of his gourd and then he looks like shit that yeah it looks like shit still sounds good i mean he's yeah. saying alabama pines and i'm like i'm waiting for him to sound like he's fucked up but he sounds great but then you see him deteriorate and you know that of course was the night that led him to get sober and then of course spawned yeah, the the most one of the most life changing records certainly for him, but I mean for his audience as well, myself included. I mean it it's it's like a work of art that that album. So um, so I knew a lot, you know, but I you never really know, you know. I knew he was a drunk. I knew he was a drunk. I knew he he partied a lot and he got sober and fell in love and and is a family man now. And uh, but man, that that movie I'd been waiting for it for so long. And my wife went to sleep and I put it on <laughs> and I watched it two times back to back <laughs> and was just like, I cried through it, man. I laughed hysterically. I, I marveled at it, the whole thing, the whole package. So, so tell me, tell me about getting into Isbel. What's, oh, what's your, your origin story as a fan? What a story this one is too. Um, so I, at, I lived in Dallas at the time. So I was, I'd heard of the drive-by truckers, but they just were not a band in my, in my purview at all. So I lived in an apartment and I was actually playing and singing uh, every Tuesday night at a place in Dallas called the corner bar. And what, just kind, covers what kind of and, music are we doing? Covers? Yeah, just covers. I mean, pretty much whatever I could play, you know, I mean, I always gravitated towards bands I could play. So I would play like lemon heads and then an Oasis song because I could play it. They're easy. They're six chords and pretty easy to sing like. And, um, you know, I would play, I'd play, uh, Ryan Adams and, and stuff like whiskey town and stuff like that. I was a big Ryan Adams guy. So I'm running into this guy, he moves into my building and we hit it off and he's a guitar player and I'm okay. At guitar. And I love to sing. I really love to sing, but I was okay. At guitar player. This dude shredded on guitar shredded. His name is Wesley Mims. So he was in a band called Beanpole, and they were from Memphis. Now, it's not the Les Claypool from Primus's band, Beanpole. This is a completely different, like early 90s kind of southern band. So they were from Memphis. So Wes and I hit it off, and we start playing together every Tuesday night. Me and him are playing, and he's my new lead guitarist, and I'm singing and playing rhythm. And we, we had the, it was one of the most fun times I've ever had in my life. But we're hammered after a show one night and we're sitting in his Ford Explorer and he goes, hey, man, you ever listen to the truckers? And I'm like, no, I have never listened to truckers. So he puts in uh, he puts in goddamn lonely love. And I'm I mean, you guys, I'm I'm like Isbell in that. I was like I was three sheets to the wind. <laughs> so he he plays me goddamn lonely love in the car. And I just I start weeping, weeping. Like, I was like, this is the most beautiful song I've ever heard in my life. Like, it just, it was like a lightning bolt. Like, I'll, it, there's a couple of times, like, I, I'll never forget where I was the first time I ever heard Pink Floyd. And it blew my mind. I was a sleepover in, like, seventh grade. And I go, what is that? You know? And um, I'll never forget when I heard heard Isbell. So, the next day, I went to the the record store and, and picked up as much as I could at the time. Um, you know, all the truckers records that he sang on and he didn't sing a whole bunch. You know, I, I, too, I, I put on the drive by truckers waiting to hear him every song. I'm like, <laughs> who the fuck are these guys? These guys can't sing for shit. You oh, know? Come on. He's throwing um, on a Beatles record and just like, when yeah. does that George guy get a chance again? Dude, that's exactly right. <laughs> Cause I'm listening. I'm like, I'm listening to Carl Perkins Cadillac. I'm like, that's not the same guy. And then, you know, decoration day kicks in. I'm like, Oh, okay. That's him. <laughs> and and so it was funny but that's how i got into him and and then of course you know everything that he's put out since obviously i've i've just been in love with but that was like a moment moment where i'm like oh I'll, I'll never forget that nice and, and david you so you we okay go ahead well i was gonna ask you so you you alluded to this with sam but we, d we didn't really get into it so you you have a a, a lengthy history as a as an isbel guy too right yeah, I was I was living in LA, uh, early two thousands, and I was like um, into a lot of the alt country stuff, but I really hadn't really locked into the Drive by Truckers. I, I you know I knew of them, but the Southern Rock Opera album I'd like maybe just kind of started to listen to. It had it'd been out for like a couple years, um, 
and um my buddy josh mogg who i played in a band with at the time and uh uh he was like you know the same thing like have you heard of the truckers i'm like uh you know i've heard of them maybe heard a song or two you know get on the plane or whatever and um he's like all right they're playing the troubadour we're going they got this oh. new i heard this i heard this they just got this new guitar player this kid we called him the kid because we didn't know his name and um you know at that yeah. point the truckers like they were all maybe like you know late 20s or 30 they seemed old to me at the time you know older to me at the time they're like probably four years older than me and then they you know then this guy isbel who's like 20 so i go to the troubadour i'm like right up front it's a small club for those of you who haven't you know it's one of the greatest rock clubs you know if you're Ever. making a ranking you know we should have a draft of the greatest rock clubs of all time like it's in the history in of rock it's way up there and um you know we're drinking we're right up front band takes the stage and like this kid who was like maybe the first time i'd seen somebody younger than me you know on stage just killing it i mean i'm like maybe 23 or something but you know and he's like 20 but that's a big deal you know what i mean when you're that age it's like yeah oh my god like yeah, he's time, a is, kid. time he, is passing me by you know what i mean it's like a rookie. baby baby <laughs> a, baby face yeah like a rookie taking your spot you know yeah <laughs> and no yeah and he looked younger than he was and he was absolutely, you know, he gets up there, he's singing Outfit, and he's, you know, he's singing Decoration Day, these unbelievable songs. He sounds like a, you know, like an old soul. He's ripping off solos, yep. and he's also just, like, putting back a fifth of Jack in that show, you know, yep. like, right in front of me. Like, I'm getting his, like, yeah. whiskey sweat all over me. And I was like, this is the greatest thing of all time. This is the greatest band. What, a, you know, and then they came back, like, four months later. You know, it was, like, that kind of, those days when they were, like, touring so hard and, like, you know, they would put out a record and then they'd show up in your town like, you know, two or three times a year. And so I saw them probably three times in a 12 month period um, with Isbel. And that's awesome. They were unbelievable. And then, you know, he left the band and there was all this drama that's like part of the movie. And, and I, you know, I followed him all along ever since. And, um, you know, I've seen Amazing. him a bunch of times. Now, um, were you, either of you guys there at the show? that he played here uh i think it was at the uh open air theater at san diego state uh in i think it was 20 would have been 2019 i think he played a show there where so his wife amanda shires who's also a musician singer songwriter of her own right and a great fiddle player um she plays in the band with him yeah. most shows you know so they're there they're playing they the show starts they play like maybe two songs and then they're like we want to bring out a special guest and you're going to sing and like this woman comes out with holding this like three-year-old and it was their kid and it's like mercy yeah this is mercy and it's her birthday we're all gonna sing happy birthday to her so the entire uh arena sang happy birthday like to this kid on her third birthday and like i'll never forget that it was like such a sweet moment you know and it was like early in the show because she's a kid she's got to go to sleep you know it's like already nine o'clock um yeah. but um you know so i've just followed them all along all the way and um you know just I mean, no other connection other than just being a big fan. And, and when, as soon as the movie was announced, it was like, oh, this is going to be my shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was my shit too. I think that's the one Isbel show that I've missed uh, since he came here. I've seen him. I've seen him probably four times here. I, I went up to LA to see him um, as well. Yeah, I just uh, saw him in Dallas. Um, the father John Misty tour. That was a fun one. Yeah, that was a fun one. I think that's the one I went to. Was that the one I went to in LA? I can't remember, man. They all yeah, run together, but how about? But you? I don't. How about you, Andy? I, What's your? Uh, I don't how, miss them. Have you been tracking Isbel along, or you just kind of? Well, I saw I here? saw the truckers at uh, one of those early Bonnaroo's that I went to in college. Would have I guess would have been oh five or oh six, and um, I liked it. It, it. it it I liked it and it made an impression, but not enough to like go get the records, learn the right. guys, all that stuff. Um, and then some time went by. And I, I, I knew Isbel by just like reputation is, oh, this is one of the best songwriters going right now. Um, and I, I didn't really listen to him, but I would, you know, you, you, his name would be listed in the uh, review for any other songwriter as <laughs> right. like, you know, yeah. the, the, the standard. And um, it kind of went that way until, um, you know, embarrassed to say when A Star Is Born came out. I was like, yeah, I, no shame. And I love that movie. He had, he had written those songs. No and shame. I was like, love that. Love that movie too. I, I love that movie. And I love those songs. And I was like, well, I guess I should go back and listen to all this stuff. People have been recommending it long enough. And obviously I like it. So I went and worked, worked my way backwards from there. And, uh, well, it's hard too, because, you know, based on what I know about you and the music that, that you like, 
you know, Israel gets painted into that country corner mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people hear country and they're like, see ya. And I, you know, I say it all the time. Like we talk about on our show, like I, new country is the worst thing that's ever happened to music. It's period, the end, the worst shit that's ever happened. But if you can, if you can wade through the, you know, the, the Morgan Wallens and, and, and the shitheads that are in country music now, and get to the Isbells of the world and, you know, R Ryan Adams to some extent, I know he's had his issues, uh, but, you know, some of the guys that actually know how to sit down with a guitar and, and make us write a song that'll make you cry um, or smile or think about your parents or your kids or whatever. I mean, that's where it's at, dude. That's, that's, that's completely it. And yeah, he sings with a, 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 a Southern accent, but I, I certainly wouldn't call him country music because I think that just has such a negative connotation these days. And I think it scares people away when they, Oh, he's country. I'm not gonna listen to that shit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and, and then I think there's like people who know that there's like, there's country music that's okay to like, like, you know, right. Isbel and, and, yeah. and, and Zach yeah. Bryan or whatever else. Right. Right. And, uh, and, and I do, I mean, and then, you know, there's like more Southern rock influenced, uh, jam music or stuff like yep. that. And, uh, Billy Strings and Marcus King and that sort of stuff, which I guess, you know, has a leg in country influences. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think he's great. I think um, it, it's interesting. I don't, he, he's like re really famous, <laughs> you know, like yeah. he is deceptively famous. I think in, in terms yeah. of like how many people know him and know him pretty well. I always, I always love that. Um, you know, and I'm sure you feel the same way, David, like when you're in on a guy for so long and you're telling and you're, you're spreading the word. Um, and then you finally see him get famous. It's never bothered me. You know, I, there's a lot of people that say, Oh, well, you know, I liked him before he sold out. And when you're a songwriter, I don't think you can really ever sell out, you know? And he said it in the documentary, like, that's why I give a shit about the prepositions in my songs because I'm not trying to make people dance. You know, they're not dancing at my show. If they were dancing, I wouldn't give a shit about the prepositions. <laughs> I'd just write a chorus and be on the way. You know, I'm down at the river. I got my six pack, my truck, and you know, he doesn't give a shit, but he fucking goes over this. That scene to me was just like, Oh my God, the attention to detail. Yeah was just brilliant and he cares and he if you put that much of your heart and soul into your music like man there's just something to be said for that so i i love that he's famous now i love that for him he deserves it he's yeah. one you know he deserves every everything that comes his way you know it's funny I, i've told friends look i'm not a political person but if he ran for office, I'd be fucking going door to door. Like he's, that's how much I, I love him and believe in him and, and uh, respect him. I would be, I'd be knocking on doors, pa passing out pamphlets for sure. And, and as big as he is, uh, I mean, you definitely, he's definitely the kind of guy where like, you know, if he, you know, he, maybe he's a few years younger than me. So maybe he's born around 1980. Like if he had been born in, you know, 1950 and came up in the seventies, he would be Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he would be right. like, yeah. you know, yeah, a David, billionaire, David like whatever, you know, he, yeah. yeah, he'd yeah. be a guy like that. However, he came along at a time, just kind of the end of the CD boom. And, and when, you know, the era of kind of rock was kind of coming out and things were becoming more niche. So like, he's a very big, famous, not a cult act, but you know what I mean? He's like, I don't know that my parents know who yeah. he is. You know what I mean? But like, he's obviously very successful. He's writing. Yeah, mine either. The Lady Gaga, Bradley Cooper, super hit movie. And you know what I mean? And he's doing all kinds of yeah. other stuff. And it's, I think he's probably where he wants to be. Like, I don't think he is like, yeah. why am I not playing Petco Park? You know, dude. And, and why, why aren't I played on the radio? I don't think he gives a shit. And I don't think he wants to be played on the radio. Yeah, I don't think, you he's know, playing. I mean, I mean, I don't know. So I'm, I, I'm in the building, uh, the same building as KSON and, um, I always bust the the morning show host, John, I always bust his balls. I'm like, Oh, you guys play the new Isbel? And he's like, dude, you know, we're not going to play that. I'd love to, but we're not gonna. And I'm like, that's what's wrong with radio. That's what's wrong with, with everything. And you, you know, because it's, it's almost like, I'm like, what is it? Is it too sophisticated for you guys or, or whatever? And he's like, if I had any say, I'd play the whole record in its entirety, you know, because, but I mean, imagine reaching those heights 
without promotion and and without uh, and doing it on your own terms. You know, he owns his own label. Yeah, all that shit, but- man. He's he's a he's a he's a punk rock guy that sings you know, beautiful country tinged song. But also if you go to, you know, somebody who's, you know, who's involved with like rock radio right now, you're going to have the same yeah. conversation. Like, same conversation. oh man, I wish I was playing whatever, this cool band, you know, right. whatever it is like boy genius or whatever, but that's yeah. not what's, you know, really well, so, selling. Steve, you were, you were, you, when you were at the morning show in at 94, seven for all those years, yeah. would, would you have been able to play? Isbel? Yeah. No, not a chance. No. Oh, so the only so it was it was ninety four nine. Uh, ninety four nine. I, excuse me. Yeah. Sorry. That's that's all right. No, we. Um. I had ninety four seven is is classic rock radio where I grew up. <laughs> it, it was um, it was uh alternative, and of course I got there right as it really went. Like when yeah. I first started there, we were playing Spoon, and we were playing Band of Horses, and a bunch of shit that I love Bowie and all the you know good Interpol, stuff right, and, yeah. and the Clash and everything else. Yeah, and and yeah, Interpol, and then, like when I took over mornings by myself, it was like, all right, we're gonna play uh, DJs and stuff, and Daft Punk, which is fine, like Daft Punk's fine, but like Avicii is, and then Mumford and Sons, that whole scene came in, and the Lumineers, and like they're, they're not obje- objectively, they're not terrible songs, but we just played the shit out of them as radio does, and so you really get kind of turned off in the whole genre but i did a um i had this passion project that i did i did 101 episodes of a alt country show called lost weekend and i i created it i curated it i did the playlist i hosted it on spreaker and i did it i did 101 episodes on the nose and then i got burned out on it um because it's like anything it's like you know i once it becomes a job it's a job but that was such a labor of love, and and I got to play all the shit that I wanted to play, and I played more Isbel than than probably anything else uh, mm. when I when I did those playlists. I wish I, I saved nothing from that era. I have no <laughs> yeah, playlist. I, was say, I, I have, would love to hear that now because I don't I know love if that you stuff. Could find I don't know if you could find it, but it was good. Like, I, I thought it was good. People liked it, um, but it was you know it was once a week, and and it was such a good like catharsis to be able to play good stuff and have people go bro that's what i've been wanting to hear you know that's what i've that's what i've been waiting for and i think goddamn love goddamn lonely love was the second song on my first show behind the title song lost weekend so that was it you know and 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 i did get a chance to do that so that that scratched that itch all right let's let's drag this screening back to the movie um right. <laughs> kicking well, so, so so steve you you mentioned that the scene that i think is worth starting with which is yeah it's loaded right up top i think you get all of sam jones artistry as a director right here because man the scene does so much at once yeah um you see it's basically jason's reading his lyrics and teach and going through a song a new song with his band and there's might be more maybe you guys could think of more vectors that are going on here but at the very least we get a demonstration of the fact that jason isbell and the 400 unit are a real band this isn't oh, yeah. this isn't a solo project and he brings in some ringers to play with he's 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 really genuinely interacting with them they're giving him ideas and this and is, just to just to, sorry to interrupt but just to be clear yeah. what happens is this movie starts he's recording a new album and what he does when he's recording at least this album um which is the one that was eventually called reunions released in 2020 is he comes into the studio that day and everybody other than his wife is going to hear the song for the very first time. He like grabs an acoustic guitar, he plays the song, and then they all basically just record Amazing. the song that day. Like the drummer, the keyboard, yep. whatever. They're making it up as they go along. And it's so I'm just kind of setting the scene. This is what's yep. happening. He brings them a song. We're starting to do an album now. So that's where yep. we are. Yep. And, and yeah, we get day one. And we get like genuine interactions from the band members about, you know, their ideas for what their parts could be and, you know, different, different moves they could make at the bridge, whatever. Um, so, so we see a real interaction between Jason and the band. Um, we also see his like insane meticulousness as a songwriter. Um, it, famously <laughs> they're, they're debating, uh, the correct preposition in a, yeah. in, 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 a, in one line. Um, and then that specific meticulousness is, between him and his wife, Amanda Shires, who is 
uh, has, has a ma- you know an MFA, and she's going back with him, and they're like l- literally they're debating. He's like, no, 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 it's a present participle though, right? Like, and, and, yeah, and, and she, you know, and there, I mean, it's like a it's a, like an advanced composition course from you know from college. And they're going back and forth. And so not only do you see him as a songwriter, you also see their relationship and how they, yeah. how they interact with each other as a, as a romantic couple and as a, yeah, as a creative duo. Well, that, that whole thing of, you know, once I, once I bring the, the song in, that means it's already been vetted by Amanda. Yeah. And, the re- and he says, you know, the, and she says the reason that he runs it by me is I can't, I cannot stand, um, a bad, a bad lyric. I just can't stand a bad song. And and I will tell him, you know, that's shit. If it's shit, it's shit. And that's hard, man. Like I've run bits of mine through my wife and she's like, Oh, that's terrible. I'm like, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> like, okay. And then guess what? It, Which one it of us is on the radio? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> fucking do your own shit. And, and, but I'll tell it, it's like, he says like, you have to put your ego aside and, and, and he trusts her. And then I loved it, man. My favorite line in the movie is he said, I'm not afraid of anything. Once she's given her thumbs up, like, I know it's a good, I know it's good. And I was like, God dang, man, that is, that's really cool. And you know, you hear them talking and she's, he's like, but if I say it this way, I'm given the key to the whole hotel. And that doesn't make sense. You you see her, you see her, acquiesce just a little yeah. bit and she's like fine whatever you want to do and then he, it clicks he's like shit she's right let's yeah. do it like this yeah and it's just a it's a real eye opener um between their those two and i gotta be honest i don't know if you guys felt this way either i watched that relationship unfold and i i told my mother-in-law who's a huge music person as well i said watch this doc and text me and I just have one question for you. And I said, are they going to make it? Yeah. And, and she watched it and she texted me and she goes, he's tough. He's, <laughs> he's tough. I don't, I don't know if they will. And I go, I, there's parts of it where I'm like, oh man, how, look how loving and sweet and perfect they are for each other. And then there's parts where I'm like, oh shit, dude, I, I don't know if this is going to, going to last. And I, I mean, I guess you could say that for, almost any relationship that you know right like yeah we all think it, it will but man you put a camera in there oh by the way and you got to go to work with them every single minute of every day and be and creative cr- be and creative together your soul. And, well, oh my god it's also like you, you ever like been at like a like a, a party or like a weekend couples thing or a dinner party or something and you hear one person say to say to their spouse like just something kind of nasty and you're and yeah. like you over here and you're like oh oh no like <laughs> oh, you're it's like you like it like freezes the whole room right yeah. well just imagine like everyone's mic'd there's cameras that are not gonna miss any glance any eyebrow raise any tone <sighs> like you know it's like <laughs> it's 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 just like that except nothing is getting through so right. like, yeah, you know, it, it paints a harsh light. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely, it's tough, man. And you, I mean, like the first moment I met Mark, this is going to, now this is turning into like guys will <laughs> have a podcast rather than do therapy. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like the first second I met my wife 14 years ago at the whistle stop bar, uh, down the corner here in San Diego, uh, immediately was clear to me that this is not a person I can bullshit. Now I I was right. not, you know, I didn't have the problems and issues that Jason had. Not that I'm perfect, but I didn't have that particular set of problems. Um, but like, yeah, it was already attracted to me for the moment. Like it was like, okay, I have to be like this, like this person just, I cannot like, it's, there's no way, you know what I mean? Like there's going to be BS. And I feel like I, I empathize in a way with that, with the documentary watching it, because it seems like the only person that could like, you know, pull Jason out of the unbelievably bad situation he was in with his alcoholism and everything else in his life, um, was this person who like, he cannot bullshit like he cannot let yeah. nothing's going to get by and he needs mm-hmm. that uh accountability yeah and, gotta have it uh, yeah gotta and, have and, it. and and so um but again yeah i mean to like to have it all on camera on you know 
Music Box, HBO, <laughs> Jason Isbell running runner on empty, <laughs> whatever we call it, <laughs> no, is, is a lot, you know? I mean, it's well, like, it, I told people, like, hey, you know, you should watch this movie. It's great. But trust me, like, it's it's a lot. It's emotional. Well, like, at, a at, lot risk of, at risk of insulting, at, at risk of insulting a, a, a genius songwriter and brilliant musician who seems like a, a sweet guy, I have known some whip smart people who have gone through recovery and there is a familiarity I see with him of people who know they are smart enough to intellectualize their problems and it can really snow people under and you can sound like you're taking accountability for things Mm. when you're doing the exact opposite by saying very smart words and throwing a lot of, of uh, general wisdom around them. And I do think he would be at, at r- real risk of, of being able to talk himself into some real, some shit. If there wasn't somebody to say like, this, this isn't a song like, like drop, yeah. drop, drop the language. We're, we're talking, yeah. you know, we're talking. Yep. Right. No, yeah. she, and it's true. And, and you, you see, let you see in the doc when she says, he, you know, they ask him, Hey, how's, how's everything going? He's like, oh, it's great. Uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, everything's fine. I've written these songs. I'm happy. And then she's like, he's so full of shit. I'm going to go up and drag him back here <laughs> and make him answer this question. Honestly, because he's dying inside. He <laughs> is a ball of anxiety and it comes through in grumpiness. And I, I mean, it, I just, I relate, I relate to that so much as you know um as somebody that has to basically get material together every day and then try to talk about it and i don't you know sing and write songs about it but to have to talk about it five days a week Mm -hmm. 20 hours a week to stay fresh to stay enthusiastic uh even when shit's not going great i man i i relate to the 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 pressure part and then the, 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 like having to perform. And then I relate to having to be present here and a good dad, all of that. There's just so much in it that I, it it just, it hit home with me and it, it touched my heart, you know, to watch him as a dad and, and to watch their struggles. And I learned a lot, man. I did. I learned a lot, uh, about how they, um, interacted and, um, I found myself, you know, self reflecting on some of my behavior by mm-hmm. watching this going, Oh dude, I've, I've done way worse than that. Like <laughs> I've, I've done way worse. I've said way worse. Um, you know, and, and I've been way grumpier, uh, mm-hmm. than he was. So, you know, it definitely, definitely hit home. I think you're right though, Andy, you know, without, um, without Amanda there, she is truly, truly like the rock of that household i mean just he said it he said i'm no good to them if i don't get to do what i want to do and i think there's a part of that that's maybe selfish but i think when you're him you have to be right you're running a record label you're putting out your own music you have to write the songs you're the leader of a band right it's a lot of pressure it's Mm -hmm. tough i sympathize but he's like that's the they know that if I don't get to do this, they don't want to be around me. And I don't know that that's fair for them, but that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. And man, I, I, I read, I saw that part and I went, Oh shit, <laughs> yeah. that sounds way familiar, <laughs> way familiar. So it, it, it was a, a bit of an eye opener. And, and um, then you, you know, you see him, uh, it, it was just really uncomfortable. Like you watch the band members, like, Oh, I do. And da- <laughs> Those the producer guys. Yeah. Dave Cobb is like, oh shit, like just looking around, like everyone's uncomfortable. It's yeah. a, it's the it's the couple, the, the drunk, they- the drunk couple at the dinner party where the guy, you know, the yeah. guy pops off or she says something, and it's over. Yeah, over. Yeah, they all have like a practiced way of like when they hear it, they're like, oh, oh, I was uh, just trying to to fix just these noodling keys. around I, here. You know, yeah, I just yeah, had these this. keys I was working on. Right, yeah, seen my wah wah pedal. Now, yeah. um, all right, yeah. so let's talk about like what we do see in the movie because basically what happens is first half of the movie is the recording of the album more or less, and you know it's going along. 
Amanda, in addition, she's not just hanging out in the studio, which may be, be enough, but you know, but like she also like sings backup on every song. She plays fiddle. So very much impo- a, an important part of this. And then as things go on, tension kind of builds. A lot of it is implied. And at one point, basically what happens is Jason walks into the studio. Uh, I'm kind of fast forwarding through a few things, but Jason walks into the studio in the morning and the producer, Dave's like, well, how's it going? He's like, not good. I didn't really sleep, you know, whatever. And it sort of comes out in the, in, in the, by way of discussion that like, well, he spent the last night at a hotel and he's not hundred percent sure when he's going home. Amanda's conspicuously not in the studio at this point. And she, and more or less like a week or two goes by through this process where they really are not talking. Jason's staying in a hotel and it's just, you, you don't really know what's going to happen. Now, eventually they do come back together. But I guess the question is like, how much does the movie, movie really show? How much is implied? I don't know. Like how, like, you got to really read in, I guess, to, to really, if you, to know exactly like if you what you had yeah. to on. If you had the Cliff's notes of like what their dispute was, strictly based on what actually happens on camera, it'd be like, he said her fiddle was too loud. Too loud. And I, th- that's about it. She's like not, he's, and, you know? At one point he says she's not really in the band, which is a weird kind of comment. Yeah. Like, definitely. That was band. weird. That was weird. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think was he really, just that I think was odd. And being charitable, it seems like he just meant like she has kind of a different role than the other band members, like just because right. she's his wife and she's also effectively his editor and you know has right. all these other roles. So she and sometimes she, like when they go into And tour, she has like, her own career too. Right. She has her yeah, own career. She's so she's not always career. playing with them. So, you know, she's not in the band in the same way like the drummer's there every day and like whatever. Right. But you know, that's clearly was taken in a you know, as a slight. But I don't know. I mean And you see him you see him snap at her. I mean, that, when, yeah. when they're on the couch and he, I mean, he's starting to play a song and she barely touches anything. And he goes, man, that fiddle is just all over me. Yeah. And she's like, he goes, do I need to move? And she goes, it's as loud as it's ever. And I'm like, oh my God, I've had this same discussion <laughs> at home. Like he's just at the end of the day, like, He's just being a dick, man. He's yeah. being a dick. Yeah. And you see him be a dick. Like, yeah. he's a dick in that scene. And she's like, and then, but, you know, she's way, way sensitive to it. And they both blew it. I, again, we don't know what really happened, but the, the implication is neither of them is going to give one single inch. And um, they're going to they're gonna separate for a while. I mean, and Jason even talks about, I mean, he says, you know, we're to the point we may call the whole thing off. And I'm like, holy shit, because her fiddle was too loud. But then you start thinking about it. You see more and you go, no, there's something there's something deeper there. And I know the pandemic yeah. really affect, affected him. And you see that. Um, and it, it it brought I don't know if it did this for you guys, but it brought back some some moments that I had. I think blocked out maybe I, I, oh, I remember pandemic memories. Uh, yeah. I forgot later in the movie, you see them playing reunions for their album release party. Yeah. You see them playing it to no one. I, I sat at my kitchen table by myself and watched it yeah. um, with my, at the time, two year old asleep and my wife pregnant with our second child. And I remember sitting at, at the table during the pandemic, just so happy to be seeing them yep. singing songs and like, you know, emotional about it and thinking, man, I hope I get to see that dude live again. And I hope this shit ends soon. And I hope my kid's okay in my wife's belly. And I hope my two year old's all right. And it brought back a lot of that stuff, man. And it, I, I had totally blocked out that I sat and watched yeah. that special where you see and the kids hold up the signs. I'm like, Oh my God, I was watching that. I was live streaming that I, I paid for that, you know? And, uh, it blew me away, <laughs> blew me away. Yeah, I was uh, I was during that I watched that too and uh I I was I was I mean I was just such an open wound <laughs> during that time. I was yeah. I was being brought to tears by freaking anything. Me and you both. <laughs> and uh and yeah, like you know, uh, Trey Anastasia did a bunch of live streams like that and you know, there weren't that many, but the ones that yeah. there were, I w- it was like well, I haven't had anything in 6 weeks, so it's good that there's something tonight that you know yeah. that I can, yeah, that man, I can it, uh, look forward to. Yeah, I, I mean, I watched, dude, I watched Liam Gallagher play on the Thames River on a boat. <laughs> I watched, uh, which was incredible. I watched Greg Dooley, who's one of my favorites from the Afghan Wigs. He did a solo record and he played in a bar 
just him and a piano and a guitar and like all of those things that we all had to do just to live and and where we all were mentally and physically and um emotionally oh, that part of it was just like oh my god and you see them in hell you know just like they're they're touring musicians and they're like of course again and they say it we've got it better than most and right. i get it they're on a farm but with their says, healthy happy kid chicken yeah. chickens yeah yeah well, so i gotta say that with the, the the chicken chasing scene like and it brought me memories of that too i i can remember specifically hiking with my son in a canyon during the quarantine when couldn't go anywhere else yep and i was thinking as miserable as this all is when he moves out of the house i'm gonna think back and say i was never as happy as i was right now spending time with spend, him yeah. having and, nothing else going on yeah i said it too because hannah uh, my wife was pregnant at the time and and of course we didn't know anything about hey like how's this going to affect a baby and yeah. Right. With, what yeah, if you get wife, yeah. yeah what if you get covid and the kid like it, we were a wreck and so that that woman did not walk into uh vaughn's for a year a year you know straight up she did not leave the house and she was pregnant and then i think back i'm like we had Bo, my two, he was two at the time and i went bro those were actually some we played, I played guitar every day. Yeah. You know, we did the show uh, from a remote location. We still did a show. We had nothing to talk about, but it was, that was hell. <laughs> that was hell on earth. Uh, the, but we made it. It was what the NFL draft that happened and the, uh, and, mean, the and the Jordan the, doc. The, the, the Jordan doc was like, was like, it was like manna from heaven having that, you know? Yeah. And I remember one of the biggest fights my wife and I ever, I think we ever got in was about that Jordan doc. And, um, I Let had asked her, this. <laughs> I told her, I said, I go, you understand that, that we have not had anything to talk about. Nothing. I said, I need an hour tonight. And you know, my two year olds running in and I just snapped, man. And I was just like, I needed one hour. Like I needed one hour. I'm in hell A four hour show every day with nothing to talk about. And, um, and yeah, but it, it brought all of that back, which I don't, I wasn't really ready for. To I almost, feel like, you I almost I felt it. like it's too soon. You know what I mean? Like I almost yeah. felt like, you know, in 2030, there's going to be all these look backs on like all the concerts we're talking about. You know what I mean? The, the pandemic yeah. concert, you got Bob Dylan's shadow kingdom. You got, like, I remember, you know, Andy having you over cause Andy's and my family were like, we were our little pod and like, we hung out all the time. That's the Genesis of yep. this dumb podcast we're doing. And, um, and you know, like <laughs> we, you came over and like, we watched the goose live stream once we watched the guided by voices. We watched, you know, Bob Dylan shadow kingdom. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's going to be a, a retrospective in 10 years where we can kind of look back, but this came out and I'm watching, he's recording an album. Great. About halfway through. It's like, our right, album's about to come out. And then it's like, boom, uh Oh, you know, and, and then they're all stuck at home. And then there's like maybe a half hour of the movie, the end of the movie where it's really just them filming in their house. And it made for a really interesting movie, but I was like, you know, that part's a little bit of a tough hang. Like I watched it twice. It was. And I'm just like, man, I probably would enjoy like, not, you know, I would, I would have more distance from it in again, 2030 than than right now um and yeah. and 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 maybe it's more impactful because it came out now um but well, so, um and and another thing that's interesting about the movie that? is it's just kind of like sam jones like he's an artist he likes to leave things on an ambiguous note so the movie you know it, you've got the recording of the album the album comes out and then it's pandemic it's like it's a number one album but we're stuck here at home blah, blah. and then like it kind of just ends it doesn't like subsequent to that a year or two later jason's on tour playing huge venues and it's triumph yeah they don't show you that they don't show right. like he could have easily ended the the movie in you know 2022 last year when jason's playing you know sold out theaters and arena the and, for yeah and had nights, a big yeah. triumphant concert and be like we're back baby america we're gonna, you know whatever but he didn't do that it's all it kind yeah. of ends there which is like leaving it hanging, which is kind of a, the, I think the right note, but I did want to, I, I know we just kind of jumped to the end here, which we can go back and forth, but I did want to kind of get your take on that. How ending with that section. Well, let's put a pin in that for just a second. I, I want to go back to the pandemic thing because I, I was trying to think, is this the first great pandemic movie? Like I, ha I have most, one other, most, I have one other, you have another, I have another one, one other option. Cause most movies have gone out of their way 
not to acknowledge it. You know, like yeah. like um, Knives Out um, mm-hmm. sort of starts with them being in yeah. a pandemic, jokey. and they yeah, uh, and then they yeah, jokey, and they like do a very like, oh, here's the magic spray, and now that we don't have to worry about that, now let's just do the rest of the movie thing. But like, you most- know, what's funny. Yeah. Well, it, so the you have you guys seen the show Dave on FX? No, I have not seen it. No, you know, have you guys heard of Dave? No, I've never heard, of, heard of it. Okay, <laughs> so it's 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 a it's it's a brilliant show uh, with this guy. His, his name like his name, they call him Lil Dicky, and oh, he's yeah, a rapper. Right, right, yeah. 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 All right. So their executive producer was a guy named Max Surley. Now, Max is a huge listener of our show, I found out, and it blew me away. And Max is a huge Padres fan. And Max reached out and he literally was a he was a writer on the show. And he wrote me and he goes, Hey, you got time for a quick call tonight. And this is in the like, we're in the pandemic and season one had wrapped. And he goes, you're a creative guy. Give me some what are some ideas for season two? And I'm like, what? I'm like, bro, I don't know shit about. And you want to talk about like, hey, kid, here's your moment. And you just shit your pants. Like, (laughs) you're just like, you get one at bat in the big leagues and you watch three pitches go by and you're done. And I was like, uh, I don't know. What about, what about Dave? You know, he's got a, his career is launching, right? Obviously. Then the pandemic hits and he fucking shut it down. He goes, we're not doing any pandemic talk. None. Like they, like you said, they just the avoided decision had it. Been made. Like it didn't yeah. have the decision had been made. It's not, we're not going to address it. And I think the show was better for it. Obviously yeah. I don't, I, I, we all lived it. I don't, I, I don't want to watch documentaries about that shit ever again. <laughs> like, so, so that was the that was the hard part of that documentary with with Jason and Amanda. It was the hardest part. Yeah. So uh, uh, the only thing I watch more of than Rock Docs is Steven Soderbergh movies. I'm obsessed with Steven Soderbergh. Yeah, he had a movie phenomenal. last year called Kimmy um, with Zoe Kravitz, um, where like it takes place during COVID, and she is like very cautious about COVID. It, and it's not like about that it's about other things mm. obviously and there's you know a mystery and all kinds of other things happen it's a great movie um but that's the only one that i can think of that is a movie tv show whatever i mean you know there were some jokes on the you know curb your enthusiasm last season or whatever but sure. for the most sure. part yeah. that's like a movie that really takes that as you know kind of a starting off point and early in the movie you see like okay she's got to go outside okay she's putting her mask on and all that stuff but it, it works in a way that like it it's not like it doesn't make the movie like a bummer. You know what I mean? It doesn't make it like, ah, oh, fuck, right. I have to think yeah. about that. It, 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 it's done in yeah. such an interesting, skillful way that like you just take it as part of the world of the movie and it makes sense and it, it's, it makes it more engaging. But I, I won't spoil any more, but it's a great movie. I think that's also on HBO, which is now called Max. It used to be something right. called HBO. You may remember something called HBO. Now HBO, it's Max. yes. <laughs> now it's Max. Anyway, great movie. Uh, yeah, but, but um, there has not been a lot of great yeah, content about the pandemic other than uh, on twitter which is great no. but <laughs> no, in terms of uh movies yeah. and tv but this is you know so this is one where you're, yeah this does make it a little bit of a tough hang at parts yeah no question no question about it and i think um you know if we we're going to go back chronologically you I, I loved and i do i'm a, such a sucker and a sap for the look back uh at how he grew up because i didn't i knew yeah. some of it you know and um and I, you know, to hear from his mom, to hear from his dad, who are the subject of of some of his best. I mean, outfit. Is there a better? Sure. I mean, I've got two boys, and I we play that song all the time. Um, and I don't necessarily agree with all of the the lyrics, and I couldn't. I will always tell you my car is broke because I could <laughs> never fix a car if I had to. Um, but the to see those subjects, and to you know, one of his best songs and the one that probably one of the ones that get gets me the most is the song children of children Mm -hmm. um which was not on reunions but he he sings it about his mom and how she had him when she was 17 and he says and all the years i took from you just by being born and i'm like (sighs) oh i remember bro i remember hearing that so my mom was 20 when she had me and i remember hearing that and going Oh my God. Like that is the guilt. Like you're, 
like she loved you and she brought you up. Like, I don't, she doesn't feel that way, but like he, and they talk about his self-awareness as a little kid and he, how he was filled with anxiety and um, took on all these adult problems because, you know, like the, the other kids around him were adults and they were his parents. And I loved that sappy look back at, uh, with his, with his folks. And I just was like, and the, the stuff with Patterson hood from drive by truckers was just mind blowingly incredible to hear the origin of how he got in the band was amazing. And like, you know, um, a total lightning strike, like a you fairy know, tale. just incredible. Like it's a fairy tale, man. It's an absolute fairy tale. And you know, Hey kid, get in the van and now you're off. And what Patterson talks about him saying, you know, one of the best lines ever, he goes, where's this kid been all my life? Oh yeah. Elementary school. And it <laughs> okay. laid, it laid me, it so laid good. me out, man. And Patterson I, good is, oh, Patterson so Hood is good. such a good talking head in this movie. Uh, oh, the movie has almost no, I mean, so other than good. Jason and Amanda and like their manager, a few, like there's very few talking heads. Like there's no outside people. There's not like Bradley Cooper sitting there stroking <sighs> off about how great Jason is or something yeah. like that. You don't get right. that in this movie, but really the only outside person, you know, who's not directly involved in his career right now or his life right now, who's a talking head is, uh, you know, is is Patterson Hood, the kind of lead singer from the Drive By Truck. They basically he, just turn so the good. movie over to Patterson Hood for like yeah. 10, 10 yeah, minutes. Yeah, there's 10 or 15 They're minutes. Like, yeah. All right. And it was, he, yeah. He's the like avuncular brilliant. narrator and it's so good. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. so good. And, and, and then, you know, Patterson's talking about, you know, look, let's all agree. There's no way a 19 year old should be able to sit down with a guitar and write decoration day. There's just no way yeah. that that should happen. I mean, there, it, it, you know, you listen to the words of that song and you're like, what? Like, what are you, you're singing about some Southern feud and like, imagine, imagine you're Patterson hood. Like you bring this right. kid around the road. Cause you are like, man, this kid can play the guitar. He can shred. He can shred. Yeah. All right, we're good. And then he's like, Hey, I, I wrote a song I'm like, Oh, four days in. I- interesting. Okay. L- l- let's hear, it. Let's and he, hear it. And he plays that song. You'd be like, like start looking for hidden cameras. Be like, what, who, well, you know who's, what, who's behind this shit? Right. You know, what's such a great parallel is fast forward 25 years and there's dave cobb yeah. and there's jason playing him a song and here's dave cobb like this <laughs> yeah yeah i mean yeah mouth dropped open yeah I, like I, holy I mean, he shit. still could do that yeah but the fact that he right. did it when like he's like i guess i'm a songwriter now i'm in this band and he drops that song because as far as we know we never oh. wrote it like that's the earliest song of his that ever came out like we don't know it came out yeah it's not like there's a like teenage patterson uh, teenage jason isbell album that's out there or demos like right he seemed to just right. like immediately be able to write like a you know 50 year old bob dylan and right. i mean and then the next album he drops you know danko manual which is like so tied into oh, our whole God. project here because we spend so much time on the band but he's talking <laughs> about band, you know yeah. ritual manuals da- like the you know danko manual are two members of the band and at the you know at the time cool. they've been the two died, and he's basically at the at age 20 21 whatever he was like comparing himself to them he's in the new version of, he's in the drive-by truckers which is almost like that era's version of the band like with you know the band yeah all these talented I, people dude and he's he's just says i ain't living like i should like he knows he's drinking himself to an early grave just like his heroes rick danko yep. and richard manuel from the band and he's putting himself in their position he's using them as a metaphor for the struggles he's going through in his own life that he can't shake it's, it's so it's it's, it's mind-blowing it's so heavy. and i, I and, and I, beautiful. you know <laughs> When I, it was gorgeous. And when I got into the truckers, I, I heard that song and I go, what the fuck's he talking about? And I had to go to Google. I had to go to Google. And this is, you know, 15 years ago. And I'm like, what is Danko Manuel, <laughs> right? And then I got into that and I'm looking and I'm doing my research and I'm reading all about it. And I've learned, I've learned a ton, you know, a ton from him. And but yeah, you think about a twenty-year-old kid writing songs about about those guys and what they went through, and you know, it, it, it blows your mind. And you know, goddamn lonely love for me, I'd never heard a song like that. I just had never. It just it didn't it it, it hit me right where I needed to be hit. And um, you know, you think about you see, I was just thinking about every you know girlfriend I ever had or every love sure. loss that I had. And, 
it was just like, holy shit. And, and then you, you learn, oh, it's written by a 20 year old or 21 year old yeah, or 19 year old, whatever. And it's just mind blowing. And then, you know, everything he's done since has been incredible. Well, so as we're going around this stuff, like, and I was thinking this when I was watching is it's so easy to imagine a world where um, him and Amanda don't get in a fight because even couples who fight don't always fight. And so, sure. you know, easily that the period of making this album, they don't get in a fight. Uh, and either there's not a pandemic or the, you know, uh, Sam hooks up with him for the previous album or the next album or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and so there's none of that. And so the movie in that case just becomes his childhood. Yep. The drive by truckers look back and we spend a lot of time in the studio, uh, with the, with the new material. Um, we, you know, we get more time with, um, uh, what, what was his name? The, uh, the producer who's uh, Dave Cobb, Dave Cobb. Yeah. Cause he, you know, he's a really compelling guy in this and very, and, but he, he sort of gets, um, gets elbowed out just by all the other stuff that's going on. But it's, it's like pretty easy to imagine a more straightforward version of this movie that doesn't contain the two biggest elements that we spent most of this episode talking about. Yeah. That would still be a really fascinating, really Yo, interesting yeah. movie. I you mean, know? Me, me and David, if that was it, we still would have watched the shit out of it. <laughs> oh, and yeah. It and been all about it. And it would have been like, though, uh, it would have been like every other, you yeah. know, rock doc, which, by the way, I mean, I've, I've yet to come across one that I don't sit and watch and i mean i've watched as many as i can get i watched uh i don't know i mean i i was kind of a metal kid when i was little i watched chris holmes from wasp uh which is like one of the gnarliest bands of all time i watched one called mean man uh about him on amazon prime and i was like i couldn't turn away and i didn't i wasn't even a big wasp fan so like i would have totally been down with hey here's jason writing songs here's a look back and here's his parents, here's his wife and kid, and here's him in the studio. I would have been so happy. Right. That would have been <laughs> so, so yeah, happy. That would have been that. enough. Yeah. It just so happens yeah. that once again, our friend of the show, Sam Jones, landed on, it just landed himself in a, you know, just a real bunch of uh, uh, pot, uh, documentary gold. <laughs> you know, yeah. the yeah, guy 100%. seems to be there at the right place in the right time for bad things to happen, but good, it makes good for good filmmaking. Yep. Great mm -hmm. filmmaking and and a real 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 mm -hmm. open wound. Um, you have to have you and I listened to a podcast that Jason did about this movie, and he's like, "Yeah, I mean, I had obviously a lot of of input, and I could have taken a lot of that stuff out, and it had to be what I was comfortable with seeing in myself, and I didn't want it to suck." And he goes, "I didn't want it to be one of those." you know, just regular old docs, which he said, which I love. I love those, but I didn't want it to be um, just your kind of run of the mill, look back and look ahead. And I got sober and, and all that. But, you know, that that's one of the other parts in it where I, I guess I didn't think about because I, I've, I've followed him for so long on Twitter and you see him tweet and you I read every article I can. There's only been one mention in – it was in a New York Times article that came out a couple of years ago about him even potentially slipping up mm -hmm. um, in his sobriety. And when he says it in the movie, I remembered, oh, shit. He says, man, you know, after a day of working with my wife and being challenged and busting my ass and having pressure, what I used to do is go home and have a drink. And I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, that's when it, that was another part. It was small. It was a really small part, but I went, Oh yeah, you have, you were a pretty hardcore alcoholic yeah. and drug addict. And now you're not, and now you're in a pandemic and that sucks. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and a and, lot of people fell off the wagon, you yeah. know, and uh, during that time and, and, you know, for him to make it through, well, we know why he made it through uh, because of what he has. And, um, that just that that kind of opened my eyes again to like, shit, I forgot he was he's an addict, you know, it's so it's so easy to make the mistake of of thinking of somebody who is a is a recovered addict that it's just something in the past. It's like, oh, they're look, good now. They, yeah. had, they had cancer and then they got yeah. chemotherapy they, and now they, they don't have it. cancer anymore. And that's that's yep. that's that. And, uh, you know, I think if you have if you have many people who've gone through that in your life, you know, that that's 
almost never daily. the case. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a daily, daily it's fight. It's a daily thing. Daily and, and boy, after the, the arguments with her and the pressure of the album and, and all of that, who could have begrudged him? you know, a little belt from a, a, a glass, you know, glass of whiskey. I mean, seriously. And, and, you know, it, it had he fallen off the wagon during that time, I would have gone, I get it. Yeah. I, we're, we're all human. You know, I, I totally get it. You know, it doesn't make you a bad person. Um, but yeah, it, it, it kind of reared its head a little bit in the documentary. And then when Amanda walks in with that glass of wine yeah, and they, Sam pans he, to he sure does. Yeah. that wine in her hand, it's never brought up. Nope. He, Jason never says anything about it, but he looks over and there's Amanda and she's got that glass of wine. And I went, Oh shit, dude. <laughs> dude oh, this- man. God dang. She's really doing it. She's really, really doing it. She is, she is dug in, you know, she's dug in and, and not taking and, any shit and rocking those superstar shades too. The shades. Yeah. <laughs> the vibey shades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. I mean, I want the Amanda doc. You know what I mean? Watching this, like she is oh, yeah. smart as hell. She's talented. She's got like her own takes on things. She's funny. Like I get why this is Boy, the Jason is bad. Documentary, bad but... takes on twelve string guitars by Amanda Shire. So yeah, not, like, yeah, that's not a fan of the twelve string guitar. She's, I love the twelve. Hot string, takes man. on it. Oh, hot takes on a twelve string. I mean, <laughs> I, it, you know. She reminded me of of Lars' sound. dad. Lars' dad with like, oh yeah. If I was in charge, I would say delete that. <laughs> That's what he says in, uh, in uh, some, some kind of monster. Of, she, some that's, kind of monster. That's yeah. basically her take on the twelve strings. If I was yeah. producing this album, I would burn those twelve string guitars. Yeah, every twelve string in Nashville, I would I would get rid of. But she no, does. she's 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 incredible. And I'll tell you, man, the when I you know I told you guys early in the in the podcast how I wasn't sure if they were going to make it, and then I when she read that email that she wrote him. <clears throat> I was done. I'm like, yep, if he fucks this up, then that's going to be on him because that is somebody that understands. That is somebody, you know, she says, I'm, I'm always willing to take my share of the blame and then some, and, um, you know, I don't need you to be, to be bruised. I just love you. I mean, I was done. I was done at that. I'm sobbing in my bed and it gave me great validation to hear from Jason (laughs) He goes, Christ, you know, the older I get, I just am more emotional. And I'm the same way. My, my two boys, man, they'll walk in the room and I'll just be like, I love you guys. I love you guys so much, man. It's crazy. And I'm like, well, Jason Isbell does it, so I'm fine. I mean, you really did hit on something though, like, uh, I mean, or Andy, you really hit on something where, you know, you can have an issue where two people, whether it's a relationship or a band or whatever, like are just two people that don't really communicate well and are sort of inarticulate. They may be able, you know, maybe they're a musician and they can communicate through their guitar, but not verbally. We see that all the time in rock docs. Right. Um, All the time. Or just in life. Like, so, you know, and then here you've got the opposite issue where you've got two people who are so literate. So both of them are incredibly good with words, incredibly smart. Like not one, you know, participle is going to get past either of them. And yet that can become an impediment in to communication in a completely backwards way where like yeah. you're both ex- so careful and fluent in a way of how you express yourself to like get your point across, but also seem to be considering the other person's feelings. And you know what I mean? Like where you can't find a crack in something they say that is really wrong, except there's some miscommunication still happening on an emotional level. And it's yeah. really interesting to see that because you're, it's so rare that you find two people that are that intelligent and that articulate and that, uh, like are willing to be on camera and be exposed in this way, you know? Yeah. It's it's well, really interesting. Well, the thing that stood out to me in her email is when she's talking about like daydreaming about the idea of going to, to couples counseling. Sure. And I was just like, wait, 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 wait a second. Someone please tell me Jason Isbell is getting therapy. Like, oh, I know. <laughs> are oh, are you suggesting to me that talk. he is not talking to somebody? <laughs> a lot of therapy talk. Um, yeah. And again, you know, when he talks about where he grew up, and how that just didn't exist. And, you know, it's something we've, I've always talked about on my show. I, I'm such a big believer in it. Um, and, you know, it, it's so important to destigmatize that, especially in men and really in Southern men too. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I grew up in, I'm born and raised in Dallas. And yeah, it's just my, you'd never see my grandfather, either of them, who both probably desperately needed some sort of therapy they would have, they'd rather you light them on fire 
mm-hmm. you know, honestly. And uh, to grow up around that, you know, it was tough. And then you, he was that sensitive kid with a big heart. And, uh, you know, his dad talks about it. And, you know, the those two going to, to counseling, I mean, you know, it, it just goes to show you it can happen to anybody, no matter how brilliant you are how good at playing guitar, how much money you have, how beloved you are, you know, they still have problems just like the rest of us. And, um, you know, that, that definitely hit home too. And, uh, as somebody that's a huge, huge fan of any sort of counseling of any kind, whenever you can get it, um, you know, I, I, that, that was very, very raw, very raw to watch. Uh, good stuff. Okay. So, um, I think we covered most of the major, have we missed anything? I mean, there's the guitar players Roomba. That's a good bit. <laughs> Love the guitar yeah. players. Sadler. Roomba. Sadler, uh, Sadler, yeah. Dude, uh, the, he's awesome. He's the keyboard incredible. player is messing around. This is all stuff they're doing. during. Who, the, during he, the, he, I, I read he, uh, he was in Sunvolt. Was he? Did he play with, it's, uh, yeah. yeah so yeah there's a great there's some like a kind of a montage during the pandemic of like each of the guys at home <laughs> you know kind of how they're making doing yeah so De Borja, yeah. he's what like they doing? he's building an analog synth that looks like it's you know a a, a rocket ship from the 50s or it's something insane. it's super cool yeah. they're all doing their own kind of thing the drummer's just like kind of pacing <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah just he's just dying. kind of like walking the walking the um, straight drummer move just yeah, like, the, yeah the bass, drummer the bass moves. players <laughs> The bass player is riding his tractor. Just um, and he basically tractor. says like he's riding his tractor around his like little yard or his guard, you know, his farm. Basically saying like I need to have wheels under me. Like he's supposed to be on a bus, like playing a show, yeah. and he can't be. Yeah. So he's riding this tractor, which just like again, these are insightful guys. Like these are just really They're very what an incredible yeah. group of people that, that he's surrounded that they've surrounded themselves with of like really uh, well, sensitive sweet, but also like really insightful, interesting guys who are also super talented musicians. Like, cause all the whole band has been with him through thick and thin and real, you know, yep. real rough stuff. Through thick and thin. Um, and, and yep. so somehow he had, even when he was like at his worst at like rock bottom, he had the instinct to surround himself, not only with Amanda, but with this group of like best friends slash musicians slash whatever, who, you know, were, you know, just real stand up people, at least certainly seems that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the you know that 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 part it, 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 to see that those guys were there that night, you know, when they're mm-hmm. playing in Richmond, and um, you know, you they've been with them for so long, and yeah, I mean, obviously they they you you know you know when something works, you know um, when somebody is is of his caliber, you know. But had he not been sober, I don't I don't think those guys would have been in it for the long haul. Just like Amanda and, and he knows he knows what's at stake for him every single day. And that's a lot, man. That's a lot to deal with. And that's a lot of pressure. If I fuck up, I'm I'm gonna fuck up Jimbo's life and Derry's life and Sadler's life yeah. and Amanda's life and Mercy's life. And that's a lot. It is. And oh, by the way, I gotta get the new record out because we're hot right now. And oh, I gotta distribute it and I gotta promote it. I gotta write it. I got to play on it and I got to arrange it and uh, I got to book the studio time. Even you heard him, he goes, right. well, I'm paying for this shit. You know, like <laughs> right, it, yeah. it, it's a, it's a fucking world of, <laughs> of pressure on that man. And the thing, the, the one thing I wanted to hit on before we go is the, the most touching, the most touching thing was his relationship with his daughter. Okay. I mean, as a dad and, Oh dude. And when he plays the song, letting you go, and he chokes up. I'm like, and he killed me too. He said, boy, I'm sure glad I've played with these guys for a long time because if these were just some pickers that I'd brought in, <laughs> they all would have been down at the Bluebird Cafe saying, this asshole's crying at his own song. And I, oh, I died. I yeah, died. So it was, it was, yes, that son, that son of a bitch is crying at his own song. What an <laughs> asshole. I, he's so good, man. And, and yeah. to, to see him, um, to see him interact with her, that was that was it. You know that that was just that was awesome, and and it was it's it, I was, like I said, I watched it back to back the night it came out. I've watched it bits and pieces of it, um, you know, a bunch of times since. The only thing I was really bummed about was that they literally just omitted my favorite song from the album, which is Overseas, mm. and 
it has rocketed into my top three Isbell songs. They don't even mention it, nor do they play it, nor do they like, that's the one I wanted to see an origin story of is overseas, uh, which I can only imagine is about Amanda, you know, and, mm-hmm. and Mercy. And, and that song kicks so much ass and he shreds on it. And I think that's the other thing. Like we talked, you talked about seeing him live and what a, what a player, like that guy could be playing lead guitar for any band in the world. And when you listen to his albums, you don't hear him just yeah. like Eddie Van Halen on there. And he fully could. He fully could. Yeah. And he it, he's so subtle with his guitar. And he let Sadler, you know, play lead on stuff. And it's it, that is in and of itself incredible. Like incredible. Imagine imagine being that good at guitar and being like, no, no, man, you do. It. He's a delegator. He delegated. Yeah. And he's like, no, you, you play lead. And that is incre- it, it's just he. That is Incredible. one thing I wanted to ask Sam about the director, but we just, you know, didn't have time to get into everything. But, you know, that's the one part of his musical stuff. Like, it's just that, like, when, you know, you can watch the movie and feel like, OK, seeing him live, like it's a lot of acoustic, mellow stuff. But no, he's going to blow the roof off. I mean, he'll play some acoustic songs, too. But like, he'll you know, you're getting your money's worth. He's going to just absolutely light the place on fire. And that's not really shown in the movie, maybe just a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, again, it's like the movie. Well, is, David, it's not. The movie's taking a certain it's tone and approach. Sh- it's not shown even really on his records. And right. you'll see a little bit of it live. If you want to watch Jason Isbell shred like Jimmy Page, go follow him on Instagram. Yeah. Where he'll sit in a room and be like, like I got guitars behind me, but I can't, I can't grab one and go. I mean, he will sit and play these licks and these riffs. And you're like, holy shit, dude. You're like, you know, Southern, <laughs> Southern Eddie Van Halen. Like he is, he is proficient. His chops are through the roof. And uh, to have that ability and not like put it out there is, it's weird to me, but it's also kind of cool that he's like, oh no, I've, I've got it. I just, I just, it's like you have 98 in your arm and you're like, no, I don't need it. I'm going to throw 95 and still get you out, but I can hit a hundred. I yeah. can get a hundred with this easy, but yeah. I'm, it was, it's, you know, it's like, Andy, you always heard the rumor, or not the rumor, it was true. Ichiro and yeah. Tony Gwynn, everyone said if they wanted to, they could hit 30 home runs a year. They just didn't. <laughs> they just didn't. But they could. And that's what he's like. He's like Ichiro and Tony Gwynn. Right. I've got it in the bag. Adding practice legends. Because I, you know. I don't need to. Have it. Yep. They got it in them. They just <laughs> not going to show it. All right. It was great. Um, well, I- I think uh, we're we're running into the risk of uh, doing another episode that's longer than the movie. <laughs> so uh, true. Yeah, we're which, which we, we, we've, we've done we've been that. Known to, we have done not, that. A wouldn't be the first times. time. Um, but um, <laughs> anything else we need to cover, Andy, before we get to our wrap up here? Just buy all his records and all his records. get all his shit so, and listen to. All it. right. So usually we ask at the end, Stephen, which is like again, what's such a dumb question in this case? But like. If somebody point, is not, we, we might have to retire the question. We may have to, re- it's we may have to retire so the obvious. question. It's been, it's become so obvious, but we always ask like, uh, you know, if somebody's not, doesn't know Jason is Bill, isn't familiar with his music, not whatever fan, whatever. And they just say like, Hey, is this a good movie? Should I throw it on? Or what's a good movie? You know, whatever. Are you going to recommend this movie? And I think we yeah. all know what the answer is here. Yeah. Highly. I, I would just go get Southeastern and put it on <laughs> and then go, li- you know, you know what I would say? I would say, go listen to, Go listen to Cover Me Up and If We Were Vampires and Overseas mm-hmm. and Goddamn Lonely Love and Decoration Day and listen to, you know, uh, listen to 10 songs and then go watch the movie as opposed to watch the movie. Because I don't know if you're not a fan, if you watch it and go, oh, yeah, I got it. I got to go get it. I think I would if I didn't know shit about it and I watched the movie. I think I'd probably be into it. But I, I would recommend going and listen, listening to kind of a chronological scene and then watching the movie and it'll it'll explain a lot more. Yeah. I kind of think that this movie uh, would be easiest to recommend to somebody who, who doesn't really care about Jason Isbell or or any, your music in general. Uh, But yeah, I don't actually, I I don't actually think this would be a good way to like get into Jason Isbell's music. Yeah. I don't think that's, yeah, I don't, I don't either. I don't either. Yeah. This isn't one of those like hangout type rock talks. Like, you know, 
I mean, right. Uh, right. this is not what no, no. kick back some... and hang out and see a marriage end and, uh, you know, the world right. come to a near I mean, end. You, look, right. most rock docs are going to have some drama, whether it's manufactured or otherwise. But like, this is not like get sure. back where you can just throw it on and chill. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you only want to watch this if you're in the right mood and it's you're you're willing and ready to be engaged with it and feel the, you know, feel the kind of vibe. Um, it's not meant to be. Um, you know, kind of the, the dorm room hangout kind of vibe. Um, but if you're, you know, in the space to receive uh, what they're putting down, this is a, uh, I, I mean, I loved it. Um, you know, going to go back and watch it again and, um, you know, make it part of the rotation. I mean, one thing we didn't talk about that much is that this movie is full of music. There's a lot of music in this. Yeah. You, you know, you get pretty much full songs or big chunks of songs, um, both live and in the studio and through his career. And, um, it's also it's also just beautiful. I mean, yeah, l- yeah, like you would expect beautiful. out of a Sam Jones movie. The like yeah, the beautiful the, the color palette when they're in the really studio is just so oh, rich. Yeah. yeah, it just makes you want to. I, I can't tell you. I've I've played more guitar in the last two weeks uh, <laughs> yeah. than I had in probably six months. Honestly, I and just picking around on my guitar and 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 trying to learn some of those songs. And you know, uh, my wife's really tired of hearing uh, some of these. <laughs> trying to learn, you know, children of children and, mm-hmm. and, and, um, only, only children's another good record or another song from reunions. that's really good. And yeah, dude, it's, uh, it's inspiring. It is, it's inspiring and it kind of makes you want to be uh, better when you watch it. And, um, it's just great. It's great. Highly recommended. All right. Woods, anything you want to plug? where people can find you. Uh, I don't you know, can, whatever you can. Yeah. You can listen to our radio show. If you like the Padres, we spend the, majority of our time talking about the Padres. I'm always trying to steer it back to music, but Ben lo- knows less about music than maybe any human being alive. Mm. <laughs> uh, so it's usually just me talking into the ether. Uh, but no, we have a lot of fun. Uh, we're on 6 to 10 on 97.3, the fan. You can watch us on YouTube. If you search uh, Ben and Woods, you'll find our, our live stream every day as well, which has been a lot of fun. Um, but no, man, it's that's that's pretty much it. You can catch me out at Petco Park a lot. <laughs> all right so for the local folks uh or or just people who may be anywhere but they're padres fans uh come join the bandwagon yeah now's a good time to get on the bandwagon um all right uh it's a cool. great time for the bandwagon love it thanks for listening to rock docs if you liked what you heard please go ahead and leave us a review on apple Podcasts or any other place in the entire world it helps other people find out about the show uh let us know what you think on twitter rock docs pod uh, we love hearing suggestions and recommendations and uh, recommendations for guests and all kinds of fun stuff. Rock Docs is a Trouble Media podcast. Trouble is a fully independent media outlet devoted to music. You can find out more at treblezine.com. And if you'd like to support the community of writers and creators behind Trouble, please head to patreon.com slash treblezine. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening to Rock Docs. Well, y'all gonna let me tune this guitar. <laughs> I'm the one paying for this shit. I won't be satisfied unless this album is an accurate representation of where I am as a person. I know how he gets when he makes records, whether or not he sees it at the time or not. Most people don't go to work with their wife. Amanda gives him honest feedback. I've already went like through this in my brain about Well, this will just be permanently disagreed with. Just sing whatever you want and then think about it later. No, I want to get it right. So you're fighting with all these voices inside of your head. It's got to drive him crazy. Took forever to get you to trust me Like I was feeding a bird from my hand I don't think I'll be able to think about this right now until we've discussed. I'll send you a text. Jason is extremely hard on himself. It can be painful for everyone around him. When I have a hard day, I can't just go home and have a drink. There's no escape for me. It's music, we know that. Right, but I'm not going to go home from the studio and sit and play guitar all day. And then you should find another one. And once you learn a song, your mind is not focused on creating. Your mind is focused on recreating. You know, you can only create something once. And if the tape's not rolling, uh, then you're just shit out of luck.